meeting, remote commission meeting, uh, the Port of Olympia is working diligently to address the threat posed by COVID-19 to Thurston County, the state of Washington and the United States. On March 16, 2020, the commission adopted resolution 202003, authorizing certain emergency powers in light of the COVID-19 outbreak, including invoking applicable emergency exemptions to meeting notice requirements and location restrictions of the Open Public Meetings Act. Pursuant to resolution 202003, the Port of Olympia Commission is conducting today's meeting remotely. The Port is following the guidance from the Thurston County Health Department to take all efforts to prevent the spread of this virus and is acting in the interest of the safety and welfare of the public, the community, and our employees to limit its spread. Uh, Commissioner McGregor, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Absolutely. You'd please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd also like to acknowledge that this week is the anniversary of the Bolt decision, which affirmed the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribe's rights to half of the fishing and hunting in usual and accustomed places and made the tribes co-managers of the fisheries. The Medicine Creek Treaty was signed in 1854 in a grove of trees on what is now the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge. The treaty was ignored by whites for over a century Billy Frank Jr. and many other Nisqually tribal members fought for their fishing rights, which were finally affirmed by Judge Bolt in 1974. We celebrate this step toward justice with the tribes and pay respect to all indigenous people of the Medicine Creek Treaty and all indigenous people in our community. Aho. Thank you, Commissioner McGregor and Commissioner Zita. Uh, next, we have approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve with one change. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the minutes of January 11th are incomplete, so let's set those aside, please. It's been a motion to table the uh, January approval of the minutes of January 11th. Uh, is there a second? I'll second that. And moved and seconded to table the uh, approval of the minutes for January 11th, 2021. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. Um, are there any other amendments to the uh, agenda? Uh Commissioner Downey, and if I um, might point out that uh, we do need to add a um, special reports for warrants over 200,000. Very well, so it's been, uh, so I move to add item uh, D1, which is uh, warrants over 200,000. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Are there any other amendments to the agenda before we move to approve the amended agenda? Move to approve. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, we have an agenda. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, next, we move to uh, item D, which is executive director report for their own Sam Gibney. Sam? Uh, would we have special reports first or um, uh, do that after? Well, it so happens that I put it as D1. Okay. So go Great. ahead and do uh, D. D is executive director. Report. Okay. Thank you. Unless unless there, you have a good reason to put it first. Nope. So. Nope. That's fine. Okay. okay. Uh, next slide, please. So Kim Kawada has retired from the port as of January 31st. I think it goes without saying that you all know that Kim was an exemplary port employee serving at the Marine Terminal for over 21 years. 
She had a very small retirement celebration, all socially distanced, of course, uh, with the Marine Terminal staff and a couple of other port retirees who may have shown up as well. Lynn Fosher had a bell hung in the gatehouse that is engraved with her name. Each time new business is received at the Port Marine Terminal, it will be rung in her honor. We thank Kim for her dedicated service over the many years and send her our warmest and heartfelt wishes for this next chapter in her life. Next slide, please. So our maintenance staff has been busy installing the new payment kiosk at the Swantown Marina launch ramp. This new kiosk will allow customers to make launch ramp, parking, and moorage payments electronically. The structure that houses the kiosk has also been redone with new interior siding, wiring, and paint. Next slide. So I, as the executive director, have been invited to participate in an effort led by the Northwest Ag Business Center which is administering a three-year award under the USDA Regional Food System Partnership Program. Funding will support a network of over 30 entities working together to address food system infrastructure, food access, and education through an 11-county region of Western Washington. This work will be led initially by a steering committee comprised of representatives from each participating entity. It's, I have been asked to participate in this steering committee. The steering committee will be responsible for agreeing upon interim and permanent governance and management protocols to guide the development of projects and delivery of services that support a vibrant regional food system. The Ag Center will use the decision-making guidance of the steering committee to develop detailed plans for infrastructure investment and marketing. So I'm very thrilled that I was asked to uh, participate in that and um, will be uh, doing so for the next few months. Next slide. So I and Government Affairs Senior Manager Jenny Folia Jones and the Ports Lobbyist have been meeting with our state senators and representatives regarding the capital budget funding request for the Marine Center project. The port is seeking funding to build a Marine Center, which will house marine and maritime related nonprofits that connect the public to near shore and marine environment, provide educational programs for kids and lifelong learners, and develop a sense of stewardship for South Puget Sound. This Marine Center will be co-located in the Port of Olympia's new Marina and Administration Building. And I would say that the uh, meetings with, with them have been uh, positive. And so um, we will keep seeing and see if we make it um, through the capital budget process. Next slide. The Port Commission and leadership staff spent two days holding a joint retreat to discuss port business and priorities for 2021. It was a productive time spent aligning expectations for 2021 and discussing the opportunity for more robust multi-year strategy development. We did have a technical glitch in that one of our presenters, Ann McFarlane of Jurassic Parliament, was not able to attend as the internet service in her area went, went out. We'll be rescheduling another shorter session in the near future to make up for this part of the retreat. Next slide. The Destination Waterfront Public Outreach continues. We have th uh, three upcoming meetings. Wednesday, February 10th at 10 a.m., we have an advisory group meeting. Wednesday, February 24th at 10 a.m., we have a second advisory group meeting. And Thursday, March 4th at 5.30 p.m., we have our fourth public outreach meeting. Zoom links for these meetings can be found at portolympia.com. We'll also have an update with the commission at our next work session next Tuesday, February 26th at 2.30 p.m. And a presentation of the final plan will be brought to the commission for consideration and acceptance on March 8th and March 22nd. Next slide. The Port of Olympia has been working with Pesha Hawaii and Marine Design Organization, also known as MDO, on a contract to receive two maritime administration vessel, vessels for a five-year labor. We recently received news that these vessels may be staying in California rather than coming to the Port of Olympia. Through the contract approval process, we were informed of an interpretation of logistical requirements for, more, for multiple vessels that would eliminate the Port of Olympia and could effectively cause Washington State to be eliminated from future multiple vessel labor opportunities. 
As these vessels provide support during natural disaster and humanitarian efforts, we feel it is important to have representation in the Pacific Northwest region. Port staff has engaged our federal delegation staff and the Washington Public Ports Association on the matter of the current contract and uh, future of Washington State receiving, uh, receiving as home port uh, or serving as home port to a maritime administration ready reserve fleet vessels. Next slide. So do you use our regional trails? If so, or even if you don't, um, Thurston Regional Planning Council would like to hear from you. You can take the trail survey, a trails plan survey and help them as they plan for the next decade and beyond. And the uh, address is there above for uh, Survey Monkey survey. Next slide. Joint Base Lewis McCord will conduct day and nighttime training with artillery, mortars, and demolitions from 12 a.m. February 9th to 11.59 p.m. February 11th. While the port is not affiliated with this training, we like to keep the community updated when we receive notices that will have noise impacts or increased air and marine traffic operations. And next slide. And as always, we have several ways for the public to engage with us. Here are some easy ways to contact us, give us feedback or request a conversation. And that's it. Great, thank you, Sam. Um, next item is moving to our next item. Uh, well, first of all, is it, commissioners, do you have any questions of Sam on our executive director report, Bill, or Commissioner McGregor? You're muted, Commissioner. I said, don't, I, I don't have any comments uh, other than to say that uh, we came this close on Marad and over the years that I've been involved with the Port of Olympia, we've had several uh, times we've tried to attract Marad vessels and this is the closest we've ever come. So hopefully we'll be successful in the years to come to uh, get through that, get over that hurdle. And that uh, I just don't wanna leave though before we've done D1, Commissioner Downey, I just wanted to. Right. Okay, thank you. So uh, next we have uh, warrants greater than 200,000. Uh, I think Sam's gonna be talking to us about that. Um, yes, so we do have a warrant over 200,000. It is um, for Brumsfield, uh, Brumfield construction in the amount of $342,043.90. Thank you, Sam, good. Commissioner Zita. Uh, Sam, I'm sure the public would like to know a little more about what that's for. Um, that was for the uh, completion of the um, stormwater treatment uh, pond on the, the marine terminals part of the uh, treatment facility. Um, at this time, then, we're going to move to uh, public comment. And uh, our commission co coordinator let me know that there's four people signed up. And um, the first person to sign up for uh, public comment tonight is uh, Mr. Rory Summerson. Uh, Rory, are you with us tonight? Yes, Commissioner Downing, I am. Great, uh, well, welcome Rory. Uh, the floor is yours for the next three minutes. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, hello, commissioners. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, I just kind of wanted to touch on some of the, um, what were seemingly indecorous actions um, at the January 11th meeting. Um, and to kind of just start that discussion um, and, and our, my public comment, read that discussion, I'd like to kind of jump into a couple of topics uh, in terms of DEI. So what is diversity, right? Um, well, from a business standpoint, diversity means um, that different perspectives are di directly influence a product. So, um, you know, that, that, that really is just this indication that we are aware that because of a diversity of experiences and backgrounds, everybody brings unique perspective to their their day to day life and, uh, you know, their job duties. Um, going further than that, what is equity? Well, equity is the process of ensuring that everybody um, it is ensuring that processes are equitable um, and that programs are impartial, that they're fair and that they provide equal possible outcomes. 
else, right? Um, and then so going beyond that, the final term in DEI is inclusion, right? And so what does inclusion mean in an organization? Well, inclusion is the practice of ensuring that people feel a sense of belonging in their workplace. So when I, um, you know, as somebody, as a member of the LGBTQ community and somebody who focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in many of the organizations that I personally work with, um, and then also hearing feedback from the community about concerns re diversity, equity, and inclusion and leadership at the port. Really, my evaluation of that is this idea that the process that we saw unfold, though indicated there are rules that clearly illustrate like what should happen at um, during the elections process for president, vice president, and secretary. Um, we also acknowledge that in the past there has been a rotation. Um, and so really the, the crux of the, the problem is that there, there is no clear process of delineating between when an election will occur and when a rotation will occur. So that in and of itself creates inequity. So what I would request and what I would hope to see out of the commission um, going forward in 2021 and into 2022 is that that idea is incorporated in future discussions. And hopefully what we will see um, is that there is a further definition of the process by which elections are done on a year to year basis. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Summerson. And our next uh, public comment comes from Sherry Silverman. Hi there, it took me a second to unmute. This is Sherry Silverman from Tumwater. I wanna thank the commission for uh, having me, uh, giving me the opportunity to address you tonight. And I also just wanna point out again that um, to my understanding on the agenda, there is an opportunity for the commissioners to uh, make any comment they would like to make on the public comments later at the end of the section. So I do ask that my comment proceed uninterrupted. And I thank you for your consideration. I was also at the meeting in which Mr. Downing was re-elected president. And I was somewhat surprised because it was my understanding that Commissioner Zita would be next in the rotation. While both Commissioner Downing and Commissioner McGregor did explain that it is not unheard of for a president to have a row, to have the role twice in a, in a row, that um, at the same time, Commissioner Zita did point out that this was usually because the commissioner to whom the presidency would have rotated was running for re-election for that commission seat. And that would create a conflict of interest if these things were happening simultaneously, holding the presidency and running for re-election. I would have thought that after Commissioner Zita pointed out that she is not running for re-election and that there'd be absolutely no conflict of interest in her being president this time around that Mr. Downing and Mr. McGregor might have stopped and reconsidered. However, that didn't happen, which was somewhat dismaying to me. Uh, while it is true that there is nothing in the port uh, rules or policies that prevents Mr. Downing from being president twice in a row, it appears that the only reason that he can be president twice in a row is because there is nothing that is specifically enumerated or excluded in the port rules and policies to prevent him from being so. Uh, I think we've all heard the term that uh, someone slid in or got off on a technicality. And it seems that this was indeed a technicality. I wanna echo what Mr. Summerson said about diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, I think the port was done a disservice. I think the public was done a disservice when the leadership of the port stayed stagnant. I do believe that port commissioner uh, Zita should have had the rotation to the presidency. I do ask that Mr. Downing reconsider his decision on being port president. I think that the public would very much like to see Commissioner Zita have her chance at the presidency since this is her final year in the commission. I thank you for listening and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Our next uh, member of the public to speak uh, tonight, Carla Wolfsburg. Carla? Yes, hello. Um, 
Uh, Commissioner Downey, it's my understanding that I'm allowed three uninterrupted minutes to which to make my comments at this meeting, so thank you. Um, I want to recount in detail and to address what I witnessed at the Port Commission meeting on January 11th, 2021. You've heard um, a couple of people talk about that. Um, it appeared to me to not only be unethical, but an outright abuse of power by Commissioner Downing in his re-election as Port Commission President. Now, he was supported in this effort by Commissioner McGregor, but Commissioner Zita as Vice President clearly stood in rotation for President this year. She affirmed this, stating that according to the normal rotation of Port Officers, she would be next in line for Port Commission President. She asked permission to share her screen to show a page that each Commissioner had in his or her packet, which affirmed this rotation. Commissioner Downing, however, without any explanation, outright refused her request to share that document. And then he stated that commissioners who are seeking re-election as port commissioner should not run for president, but Commissioner Zita said she wasn't running for re-election as port commissioner. So at this point, Commissioner McGregor came in to refute the officer rotation, saying that, in fact, he'd served as president for two years. Now, this statement gave the appearance to me and possibly to others who attended that Commissioners McGregor and Downing had worked out a collaborative strategy in advance that would ensure Commissioner Downing's re-election. This is the appearance it gave. So Commissioner McGregor seconded Commissioner Downing's self-nomination, who then called for the vote, voting for himself as did Commissioner McGregor, and Commissioner Downing claimed victory. Now, but I ask you at what cost? Not only did I witness this what looked like the raw abuse of power, but it was offensive to me. As a citizen and as a woman, I recoiled at the dismissiveness and the lack of respect that I witnessed by the two male commissioners toward Commissioner Zita. Your collaboration, sirs, and behavior denied me and, uh, and the public, I think, diversity in our port's leadership. So I would like to say that right at the very end here, I would like to ask Commissioner Downing that you step down and allow Commissioner Zita to assume her rightful position in rotation as Commission President for 2021. I think this would befit uh, the behavior of an elected public officer modeling respect, inclusiveness, and transparency in governing. And this would be, I think, fair in her final year um, on the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolfsburg. Our uh, last public comment uh, signed up is from Lisa Cezanne. Lisa? Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am basically echoing the three uh, prior commenters. I just want to say that I am deeply disappointed and baffled that Commissioner Downing was re-elected as Commissioner President, rather than allowing Commissioner Zita her rightful turn in the rotation. So I have a couple of questions. One is, Commissioner Downing, can you explain to us how your action is a benefit to us, the community who you serve? And also, how does your action reflect the values, principles, and traditions of American democracy? which include fairness, inclusivity, and cooperative teamwork. We are really struggling to support those values, principles, and traditions right now in our American society. And I think this action is a real negative and is not helping the conversation or helping civil society at all. So I do ask you, Commissioner Downing, to step down and allow equal access to Commissioner Zita to be Commission President. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cezanne. Um, at this time, uh, that's all we had signed up for a written comment, but is there anybody else attending that would like to give comment, uh, public comment at this time? Anybody else public comment? It looks like Deborah Patton has her hand up, Commissioner Downing. I'm going to allow her oh. to talk. Okay. Uh, Ms. Patton, uh, welcome to the commission meeting. Uh, please go ahead. Hi there. I'm a, a dis member of District 3, uh, Commissioner District 3, and a 
38 year uh, resident here. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak about a inaccuracy that I read in a local uh, news publication that Commissioner Zita uh, submitted. And I think uh, Executive Director Gibney uh, already mentioned it, but th that it may not happen, but it was about the ready reserve fleet. And in this article, um, it says that there, they were going to be birthing two big military ships for five years. And I paid pretty close attention to this when this was in the planning. And it was my understanding that these were US Maritime Association vessels that were part of the Department of Transportation, which is now under the directorship of Pete Buttigieg, which I think is pretty cool. But to call them big military ships, I think is inaccurate. That's like calling a decommissioned police car that somebody buys at an auction a police car, even though it's somebody's daily driver, or to take a school bus that was decommissioned by the Olympia School District and turn it into your family camper and then call it uh, a school bus. These are ships that were military ships but are now part of the Department of Transportation primarily for disaster relief. They're the ready reserve. So if we need to respond to a earthquake or a hurricane, they're at the ready. So I think this is inflammatory language to rile up people who are opposed to military vessels coming into our port. And there's other inaccuracies in this article too, but I just, I don't, it just, it's just upsetting to me. And I'm also disappointed that they may not be coming because I think as citizens of, of this country that we should be uh, ready to help others in need for disaster relief. And plus it would have been a great income uh, to our port, non-polluting, just sitting there waiting, ready to go and bringing in um, income for those um, sailors that would be s staffing them. And anyway, I'm disappointed about that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Patton. Is anybody else on the uh, at the meeting tonight that would like to give public comment? I see that Helen Wheatley has her hand up, Commissioner. Oh, Helen Wheatley. Uh, welcome, Ms. Wheatley. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Commissioner Downing. Um, I would uh, just like to correct uh, Debbie Patton's comment, or I guess I directed at you, but I'm just going to say that if you uh, research the nature of these vessels, they're act they actually are support vessels for military action. And um, I've read that they've only been used for emergency relief once in the history of the program. So um, I think that the, um, it would be incorrect to describe them as being emergent, primarily for emergency relief. I think that is disingenuous. I don't think it's disingenuous to discuss their role in providing support in a military theater because that is their purpose. Um, so that's one correction. And then I just wanted to, um, to say that I am uh, very uh, happy to support the comments of the earlier speakers. I think that uh, diversity is an important value indeed, and that we, this was a missed opportunity to not only support that, but it was just the expected thing to do. That there was supposed to be a rotation of the presidency. Um, it's important because the, the board president, the commission president uh, plays a very instrumental role in setting the agenda. And I echo their comments that it would be best if you went ahead and retook your vote and appointed Commissioner Zita as the president. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dr. Wheatley, uh, for your comments. Last call for a public comment. Anybody in the audience like to give public comment? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to turn to commission response to public comment and I turn to my fellow commissioners uh, who would like to, uh, any kind of response to public comment. Commissioner McGregor, would you like to give any kind of response or you don't have to, of course? Yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I just had to find the right mute button. Oh, okay. I have three screens up and running with this meeting and they've all got mute buttons on them. So I got to figure out where I'm at with my pointer. Uh, so let me uh, first uh, just say, I appreciate their, uh, their comments that uh, have been spoken tonight. Uh, there is uh, on our agenda for another meeting at another time that has not been scheduled yet, but where we're going to be discussing the code of conduct and the rules of the commission. And so maybe that is an opportunity there for us to put in language that is less vague than rotation on the election of officers, but that's an opportunity that the commission can have discussion on at that point in time. And uh, I don't uh, have anything else other than, um, sorry to see Merritt is not coming, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Zita. I wanna thank Commissioner Downing for not interrupting any of our speakers tonight. Um, that's a good practice. I agree with Commissioner McGregor that uh, we should indeed discuss um, making our officer rotation clearer. All the ports that I have researched do have the same officer rotation that the Port of Olympia has had in practice for at least the last six years that I've been on. And uh, it would be useful for us to be clearer and more predictable in our officer rotation. I, um, I thank all the citizens who have spoken in favor of um, my serving as president. I was vice president last year and ordinarily the vice president rotates into the president's office. It was um, very strange that that didn't happen this year as I am not running for reelection. So there's that is not a conflict. Um, my two fellow commissioners appear to have their mind made up about that in advance. I have no explanation for that. If they, if one of them chooses to make a motion to change that decision, I am prepared to second. I will not make the motion because um, I uh, am too often in the minority. Ms. Patton um, is concerned about the description of the ready reserve ships. I'm not sure what article she's talking about, but Dr. Wheatley is correct that these ships are primarily for support of military operations. They were in the Gulf War, for example. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, commissioners. and. Uh, for your comments. And also thank you to uh, Rory, Sherry, Carla, Lisa, Deb, and Helen. Pardon me if I'm using your first names. We're not on a first name basis, but it's a lot easier to run down this list and acknowledge the uh, importance of your comments. <clears throat> I think it's important for people that support that decision or don't support that decision to speak up. So I appreciate your, uh, your comments and especially uh, uh, Ms. Wolfsburg, uh, there's nothing worked out in advance. The port operations are extremely transparent and the uh, authority for somebody to nominate themselves to be president of the commission comes from, I, I believe it's resolution 2019-04, which all three commissioners um, signed and it does not talk about a rotation. So I refer you to that. It's on our website, 2019-04. So again, I thank you for your comments and 
and Miss Patton, uh, you know, as as one of the people that approved the idea of the Marriott ships coming, I was pretty, uh, uh, well, just upset that, you know, that contract seems to be slipping away. And I appreciate Commissioner McGregor saying that uh, this is the closest we've come. So, you know, we're always on the lookout for good business and we'll keep it up. And uh, I know the last thing I was going to say was that uh, I'm sorry that you find it objectionable for me to uh, serve two terms as uh, president, but I can tell you that, you know, I was acting in what I perceived to be the best interests of the port. Thank you. And so looking at the uh, agenda, I see that I accidentally skipped over litigation report. So I'll turn to Tadeo and Tadeo, do you have a litigation report for us tonight? Oh, there's nothing to report. Nothing to report. That's typically good news for us. So um, now I move to the uh, consent calendar and the consent calendar has two items on it. It has uh, bills and vouchers for December batches 49 to 53, totaling $1,125,694.05. And the other item on the consent calendar is the approval of minutes of the January 4th commission work session. So do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion. Okay, that passes. The consent calendar is passed. Uh, we move past the action calendar and the action other calendar. And we move to the advisory calendar, which has three items. The first item is the Nisqually River and Delta restoration. With David uh, point, of point, point of order, please. Uh, oh. We had the January 11th meeting minutes that were just tabled. Are we dealing with them tonight or uh, are we putting them off for another time? Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. Uh, my interpretation of the word tabled means they're off of tonight's meeting. And, okay. and so uh, I trust that Commissioner Zita and our commission coordinator will talk and uh, we'll see some email transmission and perhaps a revised uh, <clears throat> commission meeting minutes of January 11th. Well, that will be a matter for the commission to discuss. That is an issue that is unresolved as our retreat business is unfinished. We have yet to discuss uh, the removal of written public comments from our minutes. So, good. Well, okay, so in the context of tonight's meeting, the commission meeting minutes for January 11th have been tabled, which means we're not talking about them tonight. And I would welcome Commissioner Zita to uh, suggest that as a work session item, or we'll bring it back at our next commission meeting where we can discuss that. Point of clarification, Commissioner Downing, the commissioners have agreed to discuss the inclusion of written public comments in our minutes at the retreat. If you would like to discuss it at a work session as well, that would be fine. Let me, uh, could I ask a question of the executive director and ask if she's had a chance to uh, talk to our person who was unable to attend our retreat as to whether uh, that will happen sooner, as I recommend we do something sooner to get this issue resolved and behind us. Um, yes, we are um, uh, looking to schedule with uh, Ann McFarland. Here we put a couple dates out to her. Um, I don't think we've heard uh, back from her yet, but we have followed up with, with her. Um, I think the dates that we are looking at were... Um, um, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't have those written, but we're, we're, we are following up and hope to have that in the next couple of weeks. Good. Uh, thank you, Sam. And so Commissioner Zita, so I, I think what we should do then is, uh, well, we tabled them for tonight and and hopefully we'll, we'll finish up with Ann McFarland and that'll bring more clarity to the issue of these uh, January 11th. 
uh, commission meeting minutes. Okay, so now we're going to move to uh, Nisqually River and Delta Restoration with David Trout. David, thanks, thanks for being here with us. You bet. Thank you, members of the commission, for uh, for spending some time with me tonight. Um, my name is David Trout. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Indian Tribe. Um, I was hired in 1987 by Bill Frank to uh, work on all things Nisqually, and I appreciate the comments about the anniversary of the Bolt decision being today. Billy and I would celebrate that by going out and having a stack of pancakes um, every anniversary, and I, I miss those uh, opportunities with my friend Billy. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we're doing down in the Nisqually Delta and around the Nisqually Basin in general in terms of salmon recovery, and then the big project that we're working on to reconfigure I-5 to be consistent with the salmon recovery efforts there. Um, the Daily Olympian just recently, I think in the last week, published an editorial, a favorable editorial. Hope we all have had a chance to see that. Um, but we're going to go over that in some detail. If there are questions along the way, please stop me. I tend to get on a roll and just keep going. But if there are some issues, uh, I've got all night, so we can do what we need to do. So um, the Nisqually Delta and the crossing of the I-5 across the Nisqually Delta is really this unique intersection between salmon recovery, the southern resident killer whales, national security, and local economies all coming together in one spot. And so it really is a unique opportunity to do something uh, pretty incredible in the, in the Nisqually watershed. Next slide. For those of you who don't know where the Nisqually is, although I know everyone here does, and we certainly appreciate our long relationship with the Port of Olympia, but just in case there are those who don't, it's in the center of the known universe. Um, I'm required by one of my tribal elders to put this slide in every presentation I give, so if you've seen it, that's why. Um, it is a creation story from the Nisqually, and as far as we're concerned, it is the center of the known universe. And you're just on the slight edges, the outside of it. Next slide. It is the largest freshwater body south of the Tacoma Narrows. Next slide. It's this is an animated slide. Or actually, this is the animated slide. It's a 720 square mile basin. It's the only watershed. Um, next slide. Whose origins is in a national park. Next slide. And its terminus is in a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuge, aptly named the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually Wildlife Refuge. And along the 84 mile journey, next slide, there's some pretty remarkable habitat left in the Nisqually watershed. And it's not by action, it's by work of a lot of partners along the way in many years to preserve it and, and make it uh, the, the, in the condition that it is now. Next slide. But Nisqually Chinook and Nisqually salmon experience all the same impacts that all the salmon in Puget Sound do, from the impacts of growth to um, poor hatchery management practices of the past, to elevated fishing rates in pre-terminal ocean fisheries, to the impacts of a hydroelectric operation. They've all had an impact on the squally fish. Next slide. And certainly one of the biggest impacts we're seeing for the squally fish is the growth of people and where they wanna live along Puget Sound. Everybody wants a water view, either along a freshwater body or Puget Sound itself. And those all have associated impacts. And you can see that that's where the density really is in the Puget Sound region. Next slide. And the people keep coming. We're sitting at about 7 million. I think it's 7.2 million more or less now, projected to hit 9 million by the year 2037. And those people are gonna to wanna to live again in Puget Sound and, and along the waterways. And they're all gonna have their impacts directly and indirectly. Next. Which all really challenge our ability to recover salmon. And the absolute key thing for salmon in the Nisqually and salmon in Puget Sound as a whole is habitat. Habitat is the critical factor that allows these fish to continue to survive. Now the Nisqually was um, had an hydroelectric operation started in 1919 by the city of Tacoma that um, reduced the anadromous fish zone to what we see today. It's about 42 river miles from the Alder Legrand project down to the refuge. And we have six species of salmon and steelhead that use most of the Nisqually uh, River but as you can see, we're tributary poor. We only have three significant tributaries, Muck Creek on JBLM, OHOP, and the Michelle near Eatonville that um, support salmon. Next slide. And so in response to the listing, and you all know this, but just as a reminder, we have two ESA listed species in the Nisqually, the fall Chinook population and the steelhead. 
are both listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And so our first response to that was to develop a plan, an action plan with goals and objectives and priorities. And this lists the priority issues for us. Next slide. And this demonstrates numerically the goals that we've established for these key areas. So from estuary protection up to the restoration of the Michelle, we wanted to hold ourselves accountable and be able to measure progress over time. Next slide. And as we sit here today, we've made some pretty significant progress. Um, we have overachieved in the estuary, which is what we kind of do in the Nisqually. We've restored 900 acres there. Nearly the full functional values of the estuary have been restored. Uh, we've protected 77% of the Nisqually main stem, which is pretty remarkable. And then some significant restoration opportunities in the upper watershed we've taken advantage of. Next slide. But certainly the key focus for our salmon recovery efforts is the heart of the Nisqually watershed. This is the place where salmon have to go through twice in their lives as juveniles going out and as adults coming back. And in all those different phases, they have different requirements and different habitat needs and the restoration work down there has been critical. I don't know if you, well, actually you probably can't see my mouse because I'm not driving this slide. The Nisqually estuary slide in June of 09, you can see the white outline is the historic dikes that were built around the 1900s, early 1900s, mostly by hand, some by machines, to convert the Nisqually Delta to agricultural uses. And then you see in 2010, which is March 2010, which is a few months after the full restoration, those dikes have been removed um, and the estuary has now seen saltwater and fish use it as of 2010 for the first time in over 100 years. And it's been pretty remarkable to see the transformation. Next slide. And this is the great view of, of that. There's one remaining dike on the inside. You can see the brownish area that's protecting the visitor center and the twin barns. And as, and as you know, from running a port, everything's a compromise. There's always gives and takes to everything you do. Uh, the Nisqually Indian tribe certainly wanted the entire 100% of the estuary re restored, but we recognize that public education and access and use of the land is also important. So we provided as much of the function as we could get while still allowing the public to access the area and learn about salmon recovery and the work that we're doing and treaty rights, which is really important. Next slide. And so we've noticed in our restoration work that we've created this mosaic of habitats. And it's really important to understand where those habitats are, how they exist and how the fish are using them. And all these different habitats are really dependent on a unique balance of depth of water at high tide, the amount of salinity that's involved, and the amount of tidal action that it sees, wave action and also exposure during low tides. Next slide. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time out there monitoring our restoration work to see if the fish are using it and if they're growing. And we've seen both. They're feeding significantly on what's produced there and their growth is tremendous and their survival is increasing, which is a huge benefit not only to the Nisqually Indian tribe, but to the entire ecosystem. Next slide. And so these habitats um, we've documented and we understand them in fairly good detail. And we also have been able to evaluate changes over time. Uh, they're currently very functional and producing great fish um, that are supporting tribal fisheries and the ecosystem, but they're at, they're at risk. And I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that in a little bit. So next slide. So as I mentioned, this is a Nisqually project, but the, it reaches far out beyond the Nisqually to the resident killer whales. Um, we are currently the, another species listed under the Endangered Species Act is threatened, the Southern resident killer whales. We're down to 73 members of that unique population of killer whales. And the science tells us if we get down to 68, it's likely they won't recover. And so we're right at the precipice of whether or not these animals exist and survive. And as you can see by the food um, graph on the left-hand side, on the very top, Chinook is present in their diet all year round. Chinook salmon is incredibly important. They also take advantage of returns of chum and coho and other fish, but Chinook is there all the time and it really drives who and what they are. Next slide. And these three graphs show that relationship. The graph on the left shows that the calving probability increases from left to right as the amount of Chinook increase off the west coast Vancouver Island. And then the next two ones show that killer whale mortality index goes from high on the far left to low on the far right, which is where Chinook are increasing in abundance. So their survival increases. And then the bottom graph shows that clearly their calving index, their birth rates increase with 
growing numbers of Chinook as well. So really tied to Chinook populations. Next slide. And based on diet work and scat analysis, the South Puget Sound stock is one of the most critical stocks for their time when they're out of Puget Sound feeding on the coast from the months of about October through May, which is really critical for them. And so Nisqually stock is the largest of all the stocks in South Puget Sound. It is therefore critical to the survival of the Southern resident killer whales. So it has far reaching impacts. Next, next slide. And again, looking down at the mosaic of, um, of habitats down in the Nisqually, next slide. As we understand more about where the fish are using them, and if I had my pointer, I could show you, but there's a, a, a dark, lightish colored brown, at least on my, my screen, lightish colored brown habitat right next to the 2006 label. Uh, we have found that that area of the Nisqually River and the wetlands associated with it, which are the forested riverine um, habitats, will hold up to 80% of our natural wild Chinook for up to a month as they transition from a freshwater animal to a saltwater animal. And here's where you're going to get your honorary biology degrees if you want one. Um, what happens to the juvenile fish as they're out migrating is basically their kidneys have to reverse function. They go from a freshwater animal where they're trying to expel water because water is moving into their bodies very quickly just through through the natural environment to once they move into salt water, they wanna retain as much water as possible. So their kidneys go through this incredible change and they need time and space for that change to take place if they're going to be successful. And so this habitat is critical to their ultimate survival. Next. So what's affecting these habitats, as I mentioned earlier, is depth and salinity and exposure to the low tides in terms of wave action and sun. And so in studying the dynamics of the habitats down there, we're recognizing that our preliminary predictions about how quickly it would restore are being challenged by the fact that we're not getting enough sediment into these habitats. So the waters are getting deeper and they're getting more saline. And so that critical habitat piece that I showed you earlier, talked about earlier, is getting smaller and smaller over time with sea level rise. And we're measuring it and we can see it. And so the challenge here is that not only are we not getting a lot of sediment coming off the glacier because of the Alder Legrand dams blocking that sediment transfer, but whatever sediment does make it down to the Nisqually, which is about 10% of the total, gets pushed offshore because of the configuration of I-5 and the way the energy is being transported through the Nisqually Delta. So I-5 is causing this to become deeper because of it's, it's not allowing sediment to move forward. Next. There's also other issues, as I mentioned, this connection between uh, economy, local economy, private properties, but also just the economy of the region. This is an aerial from the 1996 flood. And for those of you who are here, recognize that as being one of the biggest floods we've had in the South Puget Sound region. It's the flood that shut down I-5 near Chehalis and Centralia for two weeks and caused great economic harm to the region. Um, this is a shot of what was going on in the Nisqually and there was significant flooding. If you look on the bottom side of the slide, which is the south part of the slide, those are all private property, private lands and some tribal lands and 15,000 acres of land were flooded and the floodwaters didn't recede for weeks on end because of the fact that I-5 only has five places for water to move and they're very small. So it basically forms a dam across the Nisqually Delta blocking the downstream floodwaters from relieving themselves and moving out into Puget Sound. Next. And if you, if you can click on this, this is an animated series of slides. And if you watch the star there, which is right across from the Wahilut Indian School on Frank's Landing, if you know where that is, you'll notice the Nisqually River over time starts to do this really unusual thing where this bend is forming. And it's forming because I-5 is not allowing the energy to be released downstream. And so we're getting this unusual bend and this bend is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we're finding is that now as we look at it, um, it's flowing upstream. And as you can imagine, for a major river system, that is not a natural condition. And rivers do not like being in unnatural conditions. So the slide in 2013 shows that pretty clearly that bend is very big. And if you follow its natural course where it's pointing, there's a significant risk it could take out both the north and southbound I-5s during a major flood event. And so that presents a risk not only to um, the local 
economies and the folks living in the Nisqually watershed, but also the entire region. If, if I-5 were to be taken out by a major evulsion event, it would impact all of South Puget Sound, it would impact Tacoma. It would significantly impact our national security as 30% of our workforce that work on JBLM live in Thurston County. So if we have a perfect storm, we have a perfect storm, a flood that takes out I-5, while we've got something crazy going on in the world, for example, in North Korea, we could really have a major problem here on the West Coast. So this is something that the JBLM folks have identified as being a major priority for them to resolve, to be ready for mission, mission ready. Next slide. And so this all led to um, a group of us in the South Puget Sound, the South Sound Military Community Partnership, which involves all the cities from Lakewood to Tumwater and also Rainier um, and Yelm with the counties and the tribes coming together with JBLM as a partnership to work on issues that are in common. And the, our biggest priority as a group, the biggest issue we have in common right now is this crossing of the Nisqually Delta. And so we were successful in going to the legislature in the last legislative session and getting appropriations to take a, steeper, a deeper look at this. We've identified to you what we think the risks are, but it's really important that we uh, get a better sense of what those risks are and be able to quantify those risks to the legislature for future investment. So we received $150,000 from the Washington State Department of Transportation. The Nisqually tribe contributed another $150,000 and we hired the USGS to do a significant modeling exercise to evaluate all these issues that we've just talked about. Next slide. And so their mission is on this first phase of this study was to build a model looking at the various impacts in the Nisqually Delta to be sure that we've captured all the risk from the risk around salmon recovery and sediment issues to the risk around flooding around private properties and also the risk of a major avulsion event. And as you can see in number five, one of the findings that we've listed here in this is not that this is gonna happen. The avulsion event is gonna happen. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter, it's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if. When is it going to happen? Next slide. And so what we found in the work through USGS is this unique phenomenon that is now taking place in all of Puget Sound as they study not only the Nisqually, but the Nooksack and other places. This phenomenon they're calling coastal squeeze, where we're getting changes to the uplands being met by sea level rise and frequent, more frequent storm events um, in these places along the coastlines. And where this occurs in the Nisqually, as you could guess, is the I-5 corridor. This is the place where the uplands and the, and the salt waters are meeting and creating significant issues. Next, next slide. And so we've definitely have, all of us have experienced the changes in the uplands. If you've spent any time in Mount Rainier National Park, you know that the glaciers are significantly receding, which has significant impacts, not only to the amount of sediment moving down into the, into the Alder Le Grand Reservoir, but also in terms of snowpack and eventual water supply to the Nisqually itself. What we've documented is a freeze line shift up of 650 feet since the 1950s. So the, the point of which rain turns to snow has shifted significantly up the mountain. Most importantly, what USGS has found in this first phase of the study is that what we used to think was a hundred year flood, like the 1996 Whopper that took out the I-5 of Chehalis and affected the Nisqually, is gonna really become a 20 to 25 year flood event by 2040. And so where we've seen one of those in my time at the Nisqually since 1987, we're likely to see more of those as we go forward just because of climate change impact in the uplands. Next slide. And this shows the amount of sediment that's coming off the mountain, which is increasing significantly. And it's gonna challenge the ability for the Alder Le Grand Reservoir to continue to operate as a reservoir without some significant uh, man-made engineering solutions to sediment loading. Next. So we talked about the upland issues. Now, if you look at these two graphs, they demonstrate what's going on on the coastlines and with sea level rise. The graph on the left shows our measured um, changes in sea level rise versus the trajectory in the last um, 12 to 50, actually longer than that, almost 20 years. We're seeing an increase in sea level rise by 3.3 millimeters a year. Now, in any given year, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but you add it up over time and that becomes pretty significant. 
And you're, you, I'm sure you're ex experiencing the same kind of sea level rise and impacts in your operations as well. The graph on the right shows that South Puget Sound, lucky us, we're gonna experience the highest of the high sea level rises just because of the, the way the basin is created. And so where the coast may see um, long-term increases of four feet, in South Puget Sound, we're likely to see increases of 5.2 feet. And this is based on projections that were made a few years ago. Updates show it even be more significant. Next slide. So we've all read and heard about ice melting occurring at incredible rates, both in Antarctic and in Greenland. And when this was first becoming known, the scientific community projected what the changes would be in sea level rise and made predictions. This was back in 2004, I believe. And at the low end of the projections, they were guessing somewhere between two to two and a half feet. Well, we're already exceeding that in many places in the United States. And the high point they established in that year, 3.3 feet, is now the low end of our current projections. So as we learn more, we're experiencing um, changes that are occurring much more rapidly and significantly than we anticipated 15 years ago. Next slide. And so, you know, as we look at just developing the model to, pr to be able to provide options to uh, protect the habitat values that we care about, but also to protect I-5, um, USGS has developed this incredible model and spent a lot of time ground truthing it. And it brings together all of these things that I just talked about. Next slide. It looks at um, all the various elements down in the Nisqually Delta. It looks at, in particular, Washaw was concerned about the potential evulsion event that may occur down on the I-5 corridor. And it brings together all the various impacts occurring in the uplands and in sea level rise all together with a single model. Next slide. And so when you look at all these conditions and how they're all stacking up, they have massive impacts in South Puget Sound from sea level rise, and global warming, climate change in the oceans, and how that's delivering more powerful storms and warmer storms into the region. Well, you wouldn't know it by today. Today's a cold day, but this has been a pretty warm winter and a very wet winter. And this, I'm afraid, is gonna be our future as we're gonna see more wet and more warm moving in our way. This also takes into account changes in wave action as a result of increased storm intensity in South Sound. Next slide. And so again, looking at that particular spot or right across from the Wahilu Indian School, the, red, the, the, the picture on the right shows where it is today in 2019. And it is significantly flowing upstream. And so the USGS looked at, well, what are the risks of moving towards I-5 and taking it out? And what they're able to determine based on the current rate of erosion on that site, somewhere between 17 and 30 years, it will take out I-5. So again, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And when is on the outside window, 17 to 30 years. Now, what USGS can't predict because of limitations is the impact of a major flood event, which could occur next week or the week after. It'll undoubtedly increase the amount of erosion that's going on, but we may have a single event like the 96 event that could simply jump channel and take out I-5. Now, the elevation difference between that bend in the river and I-5 is four feet. And it's all um, river sediment. So it's not very solid substrate. It won't take much to carve a new channel. And uh, we need to be ready for that. Next slide. And so we taking the model um, results and running different scenarios and looking how things change over time. You remember the Super Bowl flood about this time last year um, after the Kansas City Chiefs actually won the game. Um, we had some minor flooding. It was a one in 10 year event. So it wasn't a big flood, but you can see based on the blue, the color of the blue on the bottom part of the slide where I-5 crosses, there was some pretty significant flooding, uh, including at my new office down in the Nisqually Valley. If you add one meter of sea level rise to that, what you'll see is that flooding expands uh, a little bit on the McAllister side on the left-hand side of the graph, but the depth of the water across the blue areas gets deeper. And so the magnitude of private property damage would be significant. And then if you throw one meter sea level rise on top of the 96 flood, you've got a disaster. You've got a major problem. Next slide. And so as we look at the summary of the work that they've done, that they definitely concluded that the sediment delivery is being impacted and we need to design alternatives to change the way the rivers 
delivering sediment into the Nisqually Delta. One of the remarkable findings they had is that the risk of simple overtopping of, Nisqually, of I-5 at Nisqually is going to increase significantly over time. So not just the evolution event, but like we saw with the Chehalis in 1996, that kind of event is likely to occur here in the Nisqually within the next 15 to 20 years as well with this combination of sea level rise and upland changes. What we have not seen in the Nisqually yet, and we've been really lucky on any of these big flood events, is that we haven't seen super high king high tides. Now, if we match that with a major storm event, then we've got some significant problems. And at some point that's gonna happen. Um, again, the risk of the avulsion is real, likely to occur within the next 17 years and that we need to do something about it to protect upstream property values and downstream habitat values, and protect the tribe's treaty right and the ecosystem of Puget Sound. It's this great combination project that brings it all together right here. And I believe that is my last slide. And I know that's a lot of information, um, but I'm certainly able and willing to answer questions if you have any. Thanks, Thanks. David, wow, thank you, wow. So David, I, I got a question, uh, if I might, and that, that is, uh, how many uh, outlets are there underneath I-5 right now for the Nisqually to pass through? Yeah, you know, if I controlled the PowerPoint, I could take you back to a slide, but there are basically, there's the main one at the Nisqually River. Yeah. There's one on the Pierce County side going through that wetland complex, if you're familiar with that. There's a very small relief channel on the wildlife refuge side. And then there's the McAllister Creek opening. So there's basically four. There's another really small one, but it's not very functional. So basically four ways for water to move through the, the I-5 dam. And I should say we're in front of the legislature again, because now we've got phase one done. We're moving on to now the next phase, which will be to do some conceptual design work to see how can we accomplish all these various elements, looking at different design alternatives and then doing cost assessments to figure out what it's gonna to cost to build. Um, my goal is to have construction begin in 2025. I'm not sure the legislature shares that goal, but hopefully they will soon. And we're looking at all the various options from very minimal openings along the floodway to Billy Frank's vision of having the Lionsgate Bridge across the Nisqually Delta. Um, that would be a great tourist attraction and also move people more efficiently, effectively through the Nisqually Delta. Commissioner Zita, yeah. So Mr. Trout, thank you so much for sharing this with us. You shared this with the Thurston Regional Planning Council and I'm glad to see it a second time. You have so much information that um, I could probably keep learning from you every time I hear this. Um, so you mentioned the port um, has our own challenges with sea level rise. It, that's one of many things that are affecting the Nisqually Delta. Um, we learned from the modelers at the city of Olympia that with just two feet of sea level rise, which could happen by mid-century, we will have, instead of four king tides, well now six, flooding the marine terminal every year, we'll have over 150 floods per year at a marine terminal. So that's bringing it home to the port. And there's so much more going on at the Nisqually Delta. Um, one of the important things that I, I didn't appreciate until you taught us is the, um, the, the lack of sediment. Even though the Delta has been restored and you've done such, the tribe has done such a great job of restoring habitat all along the Nisqually, so much better than along the Deschutes. We have a lot of work to do on the Deschutes. Um, the Alder and Legrand Dam is trapping all that sediment and that's not good for the dams and it's not good for the estuary which needs the sediment. So I'm wondering whether um, breaching those dams is an option. I, they're not getting that much energy from the dams, are they? They generate a fair amount of energy from the dams. I think it provides about 15 or 20% of the city of Tacoma's needs. Um, mm. it's, it's very likely that the dams mark the end of the Anadromous zone. It's possible Spring Chinook may have gotten above. There's a natural falls just behind them. Um, so 
it's important to know that there probably wasn't a ton of habitat lost in the Nisqually as, as a result of the dams. So because, because it's outside of the anadromous zone, it provides a unique opportunity to be thinking about water management. And one of the challenges we're going to have in the Nisqually is that if we were to take out the dams, we would go to a run of the river operation. Basically, whatever comes off the mountain is the flow of the river. In August and September, the inflow to the reservoir can be below 50 CFS, 50 cubic feet per second. But the minimum flows in the Nisqually are 360 cubic feet per second. And so we would lose a lot of fish habitat if we didn't have the dam to help re-regulate the flows there. In fact, I think one possible solution to salmon recovery is to locate some water control structures outside of the anadromous zone managed um, properly to provide for uh, flow augmentation for the downstream habitat. So there's tremendous value there, but the, your question about, okay, now we have it, we're not gonna remove it. What do we do with the sediment that's behind it? And so that's a significant challenge. In fact, we're hiring the same USGS folks to help strategize um, with the city of Tacoma or Tacoma Power how do we move that sediment effectively downstream? And there's a couple of options, but as Tacoma is getting ready for their next license, which is up, I think, in about 12 years, we're gonna have to have a strategy in place to deal with that, um, that sediment. And they know it and they're working with us and they're great partners. So I'm confident we'll have a solution that'll help, um, help in the Squally Delta. Yeah, the water management of the dam, I had, hadn't thought about how important that is. So you need the sediment, it's trapping sediment, but you also need the water that it provides in the summer. Yeah. I have yeah. another question, but I bet um, the other commissioners have some too. So I'm gonna do the round robin. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Commissioner. I, I, I did have, it was the same, uh, almost the same question that uh, Commissioner Zita. Uh, first of all, let me state I appreciate the presentation. It was like drinking from a fire hose, and I'm Sorry. still absorbing all that. Uh, and uh, but uh, anyway, my, my question is on the sediment. You said how do you? Um, my question is how do you rectify that issue short term and long term? Is there? I mean, is that one of the? And you might have answered that, and I might have not picked it up in, during the presentation. But. No. So the uh, dealing with the license is really a long term solution to that. It's probably not something we're gonna have in play for, for 15 years, but we need to do something sooner than that. And so we're working with the, the Tacoma Power and the city of Tacoma to see if we can somehow transport the sediment downstream. Now we might be able to do it by trucks or barges, but the other thing we can do, and we've noticed this every year now because of the, the drought we've been in during the summer is that we basically have two Nisqually Deltas we have a Nisqually Delta just outside of Ashford that enters into the reservoir where all the sediment is, and then the Nisqually Delta down in the sound. We might be able to manage the reservoir in a way if we could, and they're really good about weather reporting in the, and they've got their own basin specific weather report that we can manage the reservoir height based on when we're gonna get a summer event and maybe redistribute um, that sediment downstream, maybe resuspend it and allow it to move downstream. So there might be management <laughs> options that we might be able to implement short term that'll help get it down. Um, trucking it downstream is a possibility. Although I got to tell you, I don't know how much time you have for stories, but I love to tell stories. Um, the city of Centralia operates a low head hydro project on the Nisqually as well. It's at River Mile 26, it's right across the river from the Wilcox Farms. Mm -hmm. And it's a 10 foot high diversion dam um, and the water flows over it and fish get upstream from it. It's not a fish issue anymore. It used to be, but it's not anymore. But sediment will stop behind that dam. And every once in a while, they have to go through and dredge it and get rid of the sediment. We would like them to be able to dredge it and put it back in the river downstream of the dam. The Corps of Engineers doesn't see it that way. So we've had tremendous problems getting the agencies to see the benefit of putting sediment back in the system. So short term, that'll be a big help if we can actually get the sediment that's already in the river that's moved downstream through this way. And then the other long-term solution is to reconfigure the Nisqually Bridge, Nisqually I-5, and create an upstream channel to the Nisqually that, that splits further up than it does now below I-5. So we can deliver sediment on both the McAllister side and the Nisqually side. So a couple of long-term solutions, a couple of short-term solutions. Great, thank you very much. You bet. Great. I like uh, Commissioner McGregor's comment about drinking from a fire hose because I felt the same way trying to keep up with uh, 
a lot of information there, David, and I appreciate all your great work on behalf of the Nisqually tribe and of course the, the Nisqually River Delta and you know the uplands. So any other questions, commissioners? Commissioner Zeta? Yeah, I have a question about um, tire chemicals. There was that study that came out last year that showed that Chinook, uniquely Chinook, are highly sensitive to those tire chemicals when they interact with ozone. Um, and of course, Chinook are the preferred prey of the southern resident killer whale. Um, there's that asphalt plant down there near the Nisqually Delta, and they may expand it to to handle recycled asphalt, which is likely to have more of those chemicals and the shredded up asphalt is, makes the toxins more bioaccessible to air and water. Uh, I'm very concerned and I, you probably are too about the dangers to the um, fish, both the young fish and the returning fish from those toxins, um, can you do? What's what can we do about that? Yeah. So I I don't mean to correct the commissioner, but the species that is particularly sensitive is coho salmon. Oh, I it, thought it was chinook. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's coho. But we're we're in Puget Sound. Coho populations are near uh, listing levels as well. Their populations decline significantly, and we think in in large part it's because of this significant issue. And so there is a, a preservative that to put into car tires to protect the car tires from breaking down as a result of exposure to ozone. And what the scientists from the U, UW and WSU working together have found the very specific chemical that's killing fish. And at very low concentrations, at very low times of exposure, it kills adult and juvenile coho. What's interesting is it doesn't seem to impact chum salmon at all. And so it's very, species specific. Um, and so we need to be thinking about how do we get that out of the system through better stormwater treatment and also by source reduction, getting those out of the car tires in the first place. Now, I pose that exact question to the scientists from the UW about, we're now gonna be having recycled asphalt in the Nisqually. This is new science that came out before we knew anything about it. And his inclination, although he's just starting to look at it, is that the process of sealing it into asphalt will keep it from being exposed to ozone and, and reducing its breakdown over time. But he's gonna be looking into that. And if that becomes an issue, uh, part of the plan with Lakeside is an adaptive management strategy. And so if new science shows new risk, then Lakeside and the tribe and the Nisqually River Council who's engaged will take that on and try to see if there's some way to deal with it or does it simply have to go away? But Lakeside is committed that they're with us and they don't want to cause harm to the environment. And if it does turn out that it is causing harm, then they'll do something different. So um, we're, we're nervously watching and, and participating in the process. Great. Um, I would like to um, learn what you um, know about that. And if you're, if you can, I'll email you so you can keep me updated on that because I think that's um, an important development. Thank you very much for being up on the science and following it and doing what you can <laughs> to protect. It's so, it's so complicated, the water quality, the right amount of water in the right place at the right time. And then that oxbow. Oxbows are natural, but that one's forming really fast. And the fact that it's a looking to take out I-5 is almost a lucky thing because it forces us to act now. Right, and, and I'm hoping that we can act before it takes out I-5. My biggest fear is that we have a disaster. It takes out I-5 and the Corps of Engineers comes in and does a Corps of Engineers type fix, which won't deal with our habitat issues at all. And so that opportunity will be lost. So we need to do that. Um, to the extent that you're dealing with stormwater issues in the port with port properties, um, I would have Jen McIntyre from the WSU. She's one of the lead scientists in the work done on this six PPD quinone. Have her come down and give her a presentation. She's fabulous. And you'll be drinking through that fire hose as well, but I think it's an important fire hose to, to grab onto. So 
I highly encourage it. And if I can help set that up, let me know. That would be great. She gave a fabulous presentation to the Toxics in Puget Sound conference a couple days, uh, just last week. Okay. Yeah, she's fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thanks. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for your time, David. It's great to have you here. And uh, there's a lot for the port to, uh, you know, keep up with in regard to the uh, your work. So thank you again. Thank you. You know no how to question. reach me if there's any questions. And we certainly have enjoyed our relationship with the tribe over the many years and look forward to continuing that. So thank you all very much. Well, final question is how can we help? Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, there are always lots of priorities about how we spend money on various things. And the fix for the Nisqually Delta is probably going to be in the neighborhood of four to five billion dollars. We have to deal with uh, Burlington Northern Bridges and the bridges over the Nisqually and then elevating the Nisqually itself. And um, you'll be asked at some point about your sense of priority. And if this is something you can speak to as a priority for you all, um, that would make a difference for us. We really appreciate the support. You got it. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. Great, David. Thank you. Thank you Take very care. much. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Our next uh, advisory calendar item is the Aviation Planning Group contract with our own Rudy Rudolph. Hi, Rudy. Evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> I feel like I should show a short cat video or something as a transition uh, to the <laughs> next the next slide. So um, actually got, uh, asked me if you could back up to the cover slide for one thing. Um, I don't know where you all have your, uh, your uh, Hollywood squares on your screen, but I, I wanna take a moment to um, invoke a Commissioner Barner, a commissioner of the, the, the past uh, tenure at the port. And if you recall, Commissioner Barner used to say, um, he who don't tooteth his own horn don't get his horn tooteth. So um, I just want to point out the, the AAE after my name there stands for Accredited Airport Executive, which I've been for 25 years and utilize that background to serve you at the Port of Olympia. So next slide, please. <laughs> So um, our, our background on our presentation tonight um, for the Aviation Planning Group contract, um, on July 13th, uh, we issued a, a request for qualifications um, to, the, uh, to the public. Uh, July 27th, we received uh, proposals and uh, July, September the 30th, the proposals were reviewed and a candidate was selected. Uh, next slide, please. So the responding firms uh, to our, our request for qualifications, excuse me, was uh, Meet, and, Meet and Hunt and then the Aviation Planning Group. Next slide, please. The review team consisted of uh, yours truly, as well as Rachel Jamison, uh, Alan Rowe, Rob Hodgman, who is a senior planner at Washdot Aviation, and then of course, Donnie Cotis-Turner uh, was herding the cats uh, throughout this process. Next slide, please. Uh, the selected firm was the Aviation Planning Group. Next slide. And I, I just want to give you just a little bit of uh, background as to the purpose of this contract uh, is for uh, airport master planning services. And this particular one is for an airport master plan update. The last update uh, was completed for the Olympia Regional Airport in 2013. Uh, so this is fairly consistent with uh, procedurally how the FAA likes to do them uh, with the amount of time between six and nine years uh, at, a, at an airport. Um, it's mandated by the Federal Aviation Administration. If you have trouble getting to sleep at night, you can look it up in the, the advisory circular that I have listed there. Um, that'll help you fall asleep. The FAA will fund uh, the airport master plan update at 90%. Um, the, the master plan update has very specific FAA mandated components. Uh, and at the end, we'll have FAA approval and acceptance. The FAA approves only three, three components of the master plan and then accepts the remainder of it. It, it, it approves uh, the aviation forecast, the airport layout plan, and the critical aircraft, and then all the rest of the master plan, they just accept. And then uh, recalling that the master plan is a planning tool and not a decision document. Next slide, please. 
Um, and the goals of the master plan, it's the sponsor strategy. We are the sponsor uh, for future airport development. It looks at the long range physical development plan. Uh, it wants to look at cost effectively satisfying aviation demand in the future. Uh, it develops a financially attainable plan and uh, considers environmental and socio socioeconomic impacts as well. Next slide. Additionally, um, it will document the issues that development will address when, when they occur with demand. Uh, it'll justify the proposed development. Uh, it gives a graphic presentation of the land uses, which you've seen at, at times in the past when I give you snapshots of the airport layout plan. Um, it will establish uh, hopefully a realistic schedule and propose achievable financial plan to get there. Next slide. So the background work to date, a lot of things occur before the actual contract is signed, and that's required by the FAA, and they're the ones that govern this process. Uh, December 8th, uh, they approved the draft scope and fees. January 4th, uh, the FAA uh, required independent fee estimate was received. So that that makes uh, forces a, an extra outside firm to look at the proposed scope and fees do an independent analysis, submit it to the FAA, and as long as it's within, I believe, 5% of the original scope and fees, then that satisfies the FAA requirement for uh, legitimacy. January the 8th, uh, the FAA did approve the scope and fees for the project, and then the, the process is still in front of us, is to request the FAA to actually program the funds, which they've, they've done verbally, we do it in writing, uh, then we'll submit a grant application to the FAA, and then at the same time, we'll submit a grant application to WashDOT for their con contribution to the project. Next slide. Project funding. So project amount is projected to be 667,000. FAA grant funding from our non-primary entitlements will be $600,000. WashDOT funding will be um, 30,000. 33,350 and then the ports share will be 33,350. Next slide. Now the contract funding amount will be the 666, 667,000 uh, add, adding in a 10% contingency of additional 667 for a total contract amount authorized for $733,700. Next slide. Timeline and next steps, February the 8th, uh, of course, tonight is the commission advisory. February 22nd, we'll come back requesting commission action. And then assuming the commission acts and approves the contract, March 1st, we'll issue the notice to proceed and launch into the process. Next slide. And there's uh, my buddy. Uh, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thanks, Rudy. For that, um, commissioners, uh, do you have any questions uh, or comments of Rudy? Commissioner Zita, do you want to go first? You go ahead. Oh, Rudy, just a couple of questions real quick. <clears throat> the airport master plan is only involves that in the airport proper, in other words, between the fences, the runways and the associated property that is located between the fences. Is that a true statement? Yeah, it's it basically will cover what's on the airport layout plan proper, which is a, an easy way to summarize. Uh, yes, what's within in the air operation side. Okay, so the uh, do we have we have a we have port funding in the 2021 budget for that 33,000 and that's in there or? Yes, that's correct. Uh, okay. And then the 10% contingency, does that also get split up uh, 5% to FAA, two and a half to DOT and two and a half to the port or who picks that up? No, that, that 10, that contingency is, is basically contract authority. So I, when, when the time comes and we, if for some reason we need to go beyond the scope that allows us to be able to have that little margin of extra without having to come back to the commission for a further action. We're basically asking you to give us that leeway. So let me give you an example. If there's a certain amount of work that's approved by the FAA, if the commission came back and said, you know, Rudy, you've done a fantastic job on public outreach, but we wanna go and have one more public outreach meeting and one other thing 
to, to do something, then that will have already given, given us in advance that extra wiggle room in contract authority without having to come back again to the commission. So the port would pay for that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then there is a public participation plan during the process. Uh, if I remember 2013, it was pretty in-depth and, and uh, I remember several of the meetings, but there will be uh, a whole process in place to take public comment as it moves to those points when they need to have comment on what's that, been developed. That's correct, Commissioner. And that, that detailed plan will be developed once the contract is signed and, and the, the consultant is on board and develops that plan. And that'll come back to the commission for at different different points along the way to to brief you on where we are. Great, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? Thanks, Commissioner McGregor. I um, was wondering too about who covers the ten percent contingency. That would um, that would be on us, and that would basically triple our contribution up to 100,000 if we chose to do that too. Um, that would be the port's share. Um, about the public outreach plan, um, Rudy, uh, do we know at this point who would run the public outreach, who would design that plan? Uh, we, we have a number of, of the folks on the team with the Aviation Planning Group, and it'll be one of their members who will be working with Jenny Folia Jones here at the port to develop what that plan looks like. And then that would come back and, and we would be briefing the port commission along the way as to what that is. So that would be the Aviation Planning Group? That's the correct. Group you've chosen? That's correct. Um, I hope that we will um, have some conversations about that well in advance. We have heard from many members of the public um, with concerns about the um, public outreach for our current destination waterfront planning process. And we can learn from that process and those concerns and improve on the airport planning process. Um, one final question is, um, in the past, the port has taken homes and uh, streets for airport expansion. Where would that kind of thing come into this process? Um, well, at, at present, I see no reason why that would be anywhere in the discussion, but if for some reason that had to occur, um, or was proposed to occur, then that would have to be a very separate dialogue with the commission. But as I said, I, I don't see any reason why this master plan update is anything more than routine. Uh, just like when the, the commission uh, was participating when we did the one in 2013. And as you recall, that was reviewed by Cynthia Stewart, who is, I believe, still currently with the League of Women Voters. Uh, at the time, she was... Uh, uh, I don't remember her role, but as acting as a consultant and a former airport manager at, at Boeing Field. So um, I, I just, I don't see this being anything other than routine FAA um, procedure in order to keep us eligible for our federal funding. Uh, thanks, Rudy. I'm sorry, I, I'm not familiar with the 2013 process. I was um, recovering from a crippling accident that year. Uh, so I was kind of out of commission. Um, but I have looked at port documents from past decades and um, airport master plans ordinarily do not indicate plans to take homes or streets from surrounding neighborhoods, yet that has happened repeatedly. So that's um, just want, want to get some clarity in this process um, about how that happens, um, and we can talk more about that later. Thank you, commissioners, um, all good questions. And thank you, uh, Rudy, for this presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, unfold. Uh, I don't have any particular questions that weren't answered by my fellow commissioners. Thanks, Commissioner. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item, which is on-call environmental 
Cascade Poll Support with our own Don Baki. Hi, Don. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Don Baki. I serve the port as the Cascade Poll Site Manager. Uh, we're here today to discuss an environmental um, uh, services contract for the Cascade Poll Site. Next slide, please. Uh, the Cascade Poll Site Environmental Service Contract, we sent out a request for qualifications on December 23rd, 2020. We received the proposals on January 7th, 2021. Three firms responded. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The responding firms were Landau Associates Incorporated, Mall Foster Alonji, and Sound Earth Strategies. Next slide, please. The general scope and the general provisions and scope of services for this contract is up to three years, so multiple year contract. The total expenditures are not to exceed $350,000. They provide regulatory and technical matters consult consultation, and they provide specialized field activities. Next slide, please. The response to the proposals were reviewed by a team, including myself, Todd Nestegard, TJ Quant, and Donnie Cotis turner who kept us in line. Next slide, please. After reviewing, the proposals and scoring them and having uh, two interviews, Landau Associates Incorporated was selected to provide this contract. I am currently negotiating fees and budget with Landau. Next slide, please. The next step in this process is that we will come to the commission on February 22nd, 2021 for commission action. At that time, we'll be requesting contract approval. Next slide, please. At this time, is there any questions from the commission? Questions, commissioners, or comments? Well, I'll go first unless Commissioner Zita wants to go first. You want to go first, Commissioner? Put down your boom mic. There we go. There you go. D Commissioner, did you want to go first? Mr. Zita. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go. Uh, <clears throat> Don Bakke should be known as uh, the uh, leader of the pack, the uh, Cascade Pole Pack. Uh, he's lived to breathe it for many years, done a good job for us, and has been there many times 24-7. Uh, depending on the activity going on down there. And so Landau, uh, I think, has been involved with it for quite a while, too. But I, I appreciate you going out to bid just to see what others, what others are out there and who are interested. And uh, I'm sure your uh, staff and your, your team have uh, looked over those proposals and have uh, vetted them very well. And uh, since the port is the prime receiver of, of the... Uh, opportunity to monitor Cascade Pole with no other assistance from any grants as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. Uh, DOE is just monitoring but not providing any MOTCA or funding in that regard. Uh, so it's all on the port. So I appreciate you going out to bid. I appreciate you doing the interviews. And uh, can you tell me just one, I had one question. What are specialized field activities? You're correct in that the monitoring of the Cascade Pole site is largely what is left uh, under our agreements with the ecology. At this time, monitoring sediments, monitoring groundwater, and any other specialized uh, sampling or uh, uh, technical investigations would be handled. I would set up a scope of work, uh, do a work order, uh, and then I would use uh, Landau and their staff and their equipment to do that sampling. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your kind words, sir. Commissioner Zita, any comments? Yeah. Don, good to have you on the job there. Um, you gave me a, you. 
tour, gosh, must be five years ago and showed me the water before and after and explained all the things you do to test it. So I have um, two questions. One is, what can you tell the public? They're always asking about um, the level of contamination out there. What can you tell us about that? It's a fairly broad subject. Um, I will say that based on the way these certain chemicals were designed, they don't move very well. They're pretty much stuck. Um, in the treatment plant, what we're seeing in the water is a continued decrease in the, con uh, the, uh, the concentrations, the influent to the plant is decreasing so much so that we're having trouble, you know, we're in the part per billions, um, very low part per billions influent levels. I think a lot of the contaminants that are easily removed have moved and been captured and what's left there is pretty much uh, set in place. Uh, but this contract will assist us in monitoring the site to make sure that we're aware of what is happening to the fate and transport of, that, of those contaminants. Great, thanks, Don. And then the second question is, um, do you see a time, some decade in the future, when the site will be clean? People dream about the possibility of um, a clean South Puget Sound and restored habitat. And what's our role in that and how do we get there? Well, that's a question for future decades um, and future uh, port leaders and port staff because you are talking decades. There is only one site that I have heard of uh, a wood preserving site, a very small site actually, only a couple acres in California. And their studies indicated that uh, you're looking at centuries before you get natural attenuation. So is the biggest problem the, the creosote that's, that was spilled there decades and decades ago? There's, there's also di dioxin bound to the soil People are always asking what, what's out there and what's the biggest problem? I think you have a soup. You have a great mix of different types of contaminants. Um, it would be hard for me to say one or the other is worse than any other one. Um, let's put it this way. There are bookshelves full of studies about the contaminants at the site. Uh, currently, we are uh, uh, monitoring for what the Department of Ecology under MOTCA thinks are the most uh, contaminants of concern. And that is also one of the things that this consulting contract assists with is when you get right down into the weeds, into the, uh, uh, the nitty gritty of what contaminants at what levels uh, should we be monitoring for. Thanks, Don. You're welcome. And um, if I could just add, so, so Don, when we talk about the site, we're talking about Cascade Pole in particular and uh, the area that's uh, contained within in that and not some more generalized um, uh, area of uh, uh, East and West uh, Bay and, and Bud Inlet. Um, this is correct. This, yeah. uh, the port is responsible for the uplands and the sediments operable unit. That is, uh, you know, maintaining, defining, monitoring that site. This consulting contract will assist me with some of those uh, questions that might come up either from port leadership, uh, regulators, uh, or the public. Right, and so I, I just wanted to be clear that when um, you talk about that, it can take um, uh, you know, centuries for uh, contaminants to, to um, uh, go through a natural attenuation process to get below uh, uh, levels of uh, any type of, of um, habitat or uh, human health concerns. We're talking about specifically the containment area in Cascade Pole and not the broader uh, areas such as the, the mud flats and, and, uh, and the bay, et cetera. That there's, there's I think people can get that, that easily confused. So I just wanted to make, um, make sure we clarified that. Well, I'm gonna correct you a little bit, uh, Director. Um, 
this contract will help us uh, monitor the offshore sediments that are part of the Cascade Pole site, not mm -hmm. the broader lower butt inlet. Right. Yes. So uplands and offshore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so when as I listen to this, I'm hearing kind of kind of hearing two different things. So I'm going to ask this question. Sure. I'm familiar with the asphalt cap, and I consider that to be the Cascade Pole site. Is that are the boundaries different for the Cascade Pole site than what's expressed in that giant asphalt parking lot? I would say to a certain extent, the uplands are defined by the capped area, okay? Inside the slurry wall, inside the steel sheet pile walls. There is though a sediment operables unit, okay? That is one of the uh, areas, which is offshore, okay? that the this consultant will help us with monitoring uh, and you know reporting what we find out there and that basically is the offshore area pretty hey, much don, don this rudy i was hoping at some point in the presentation you'd use my favorite word the, the aquitard <laughs> <laughs> yes we do have a very we're we're very fortunate to have an underlaying uh, confining layer, and it's called the aquitard. <laughs> okay. So, uh, did, I'm sorry, Commissioner, did that answer your question? There are two parts that this consultant, this contract, will assist the port with. Oh, yeah, it answered my question very well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, then. Well, thanks, Don. Appreciate that. Uh, Don, we're going to move on to uh, public comment. And there might be a question about this item or not, but I'm going to move on to public comment on advisory items. So I welcome members of the public that might be on the phone to, uh, if you have a question about the Nisqually River uh, and Delta restoration presentation or the aviation planning group contract or the uh, Cascade Pole. Um, so we would welcome a question if you had one on the advisory calendar now. Oh, I see a hand up on one of the attendees. Um, I see Ms. Patton has a hand up. Uh, Ms. Patton, would you like to speak at this time? Thank you. Uh, I thought that that presentation on the Nisqually Delta was fascinating. And having lived here all these years and lived through those floods and had students uh, just last year that were displaced and had to stay in school gyms with their families for weeks on end. Uh, because they couldn't get down into uh, their homes in the uh, near the uh, near the river, and it was a mess. So I thought that was a fascinating uh, report, and I was really glad to hear it. But uh, during the questions to the of the commissioners following the report, one of the uh, concerns raised, I think, was by Commissioner Zita, was about what the impact on the flooding would be for the marine terminal uh, when this sea level rise uh, uh, hits our area. And so I'm wondering, isn't there a concern about the sea level rise on the rest of the Port of Olympia properties? I mean, we have the marina, we have the rest, all those restaurants, we have the farmer's market, the trails, and then let alone downtown Olympia. I think, I think it's a bigger issue than just the marine terminal. And I may be wrong, but I think the marine terminal has the highest elevation of any of the properties. And it would only affect at high tide. And there are a number of uh, reports from other uh, ports around the country and the world about how they're addressing um, sea level rise in their marine terminals. Um, I'm sure um, Lynn Foucher already has that information, but if not, I could send you some of it if you'd like to review it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patton. Is there anybody else that'd like to give uh, public comment on the advisory calendar items tonight?
Okay, hearing none, I think I'll move on to uh, any commission response to uh, Ms. Patton's comments. Well, Deb, you're right that um, high water is can be very disruptive and dangerous to, um, to your students, to transportation, to habitat for salmon and other marine creatures. And uh, I appreciate your offer to send us information about marine terminals. The city of Olympia has been studying sea level rise in this area for a long time. And if you Google Olympia sea level rise, you'll find that they have a website with lots of information, including interactive maps that your students might enjoy. And when you click on those maps, you'll see that the marine terminal is the lowest place in Olympia. It is the most vulnerable to sea level rise. It floods first and worst. Uh, Commissioner McGregor? No, no comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Patton, for your comments. Uh, you can be sure that the Port of Olympia is uh, following closely the uh, and is a partner, of course, with the city of Olympia and Lot in studying sea level rise. And, uh, you know, we're wor working towards appropriate uh, solutions. So thank you. Okay. At this time, we're going to move to commission reports, commissioner reports or discussion. So I uh, turn to my fellow commissioners. Do you have any issues or anything you'd like to raise at this time? or report on meetings. It's a higher elevation than any of the other properties. How could it possibly be? Ms. Patton, you wanna mute yourself, thanks. I only have uh, two things to report. Uh, on the 26th, the commission met with the POCAC uh, in January and uh, we had a joint meeting, which we usually do and talked about projects and looking forward to hearing back from them on that. And then uh, on, as it was related, February 3rd and 4th, the uh, port had a retreat uh, and uh, we're gonna continue that retreat uh, with the uh, attendee that couldn't make uh, and facilitate that discussion. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be extending that, but I thought it was worthwhile. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Zita. Uh, the public may be interested to know that at the a joint meeting with the Commission and the Citizens Advisory Committee, which Commissioner McGregor mentioned, we agreed on two main things to investigate. Uh, the Commission agreed that the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan is a priority for us. Uh, we hope to sign an interlocal agreement on that plan and the Citizens Advisory Committee will study the climate mitigation plan and the port's study on our greenhouse gas emissions to see what we can do to reduce our impacts. The second thing we agreed on was broadband. We have a little bit in the budget for broadband and um, there are other agencies locally that would like to work with us on how to plan for expanding broadband access in the future. So the POCAC will help us with that. Both of those issues came up at the Thurston Regional Planning Council meeting last week. Um, so there are, we heard from the PUD executive director, Public Utilities District in Thurston County. And they are all, they are really organized around broadband planning. So I think they should be um, someone that we reach out to right away. They, we can follow their lead on broadband planning. <clears throat> and climate mitigation planning is something that everybody is getting behind. We heard legislative priorities reports from both Thurston Regional Planning Council and Washington Public Ports Association. Um, 
it was surprising to learn that the legislature has more money available this biennium than expected. People were expecting that the state might be in the hole because of COVID, but in fact, the state has been careful with money and there's money to spend. So there's a lot of talk about transportation planning, broadband, and um, the I-5 Nisqually Delta is an important part of that, that our whole community, including TRPC is getting behind. So that's just a snapshot. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And um, so my report is last week was, of course, a busy week because we had our uh, port retreat uh, two different afternoons. And uh, it's always just beneficial to get together with port staff and, and talk about the issues and, and our individual and joint perspective on things. And the other big meeting we had, I think it was uh, on Tuesday, uh, February 2nd, was port, port Day. So there's a lot of uh, Washington Public Ports Administration meetings. But we also, uh, as the president of the commission and the executive director, we met with uh, Senator Sam Hunt and Representative Dolan to talk about destination waterfront and some of the things that we're, we're working on there. And we actually put in an ask for some money from the uh, state budget to help us with that development. So um, as Commissioner Zita said, you know, there's, there's some opportunities out there for for money uh, for different projects. And so we put our put our name in the hat for that. And it's the first time the port's been, I think, to the legislator, legislator, uh, legislative branch to ask for anything in at least 15 years. So that was a big step. Um, so that's my report. Good. Okay, well, we're down to a meeting announcements. And I know we've got a couple of destination waterfront meetings coming up. So I hope my fellow commissioners, you've both done great uh, sitting in on those when possible. So uh, speaking of, um, today is I believe February 8th. So in two days, we have the destination waterfront advisory group meeting, which is also open to the public. And you can see the uh, Zoom link from our website. And that starts at 10 a.m. Then on February 16th, we have a special commission work session and it's called special because it's on a Tuesday, not a Monday because Monday is President's Day. So that's Tuesday afternoon at 2.30. Then at February 16th, we have the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. And then on February 22nd is our next commission meeting. And those are our upcoming meetings. So, uh, great meeting tonight. Uh, appreciate your involvement. <clears throat> Commissioner Zita had her hand raised. Go for it, Zita. Skipped other business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping me honest. Uh, is there any other, other business tonight? Um, so we've talked a couple times about the interlocal agreement uh, between the port and Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan. Um, I think that's not a job for the Citizens Advisory Committee. Do my fellow commissioners agree that that's something that we should ask staff to take lead on? The interlocal agreement on the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan. Well, I think, we, yes, we did talk about this, I believe, at our retreat, uh, Commissioner Zita. So my position is just as soon as uh, the POCAC has their first meeting and talks about their projects, you know, then uh, you might say uh, we get a little comment from them and then we just go ahead and proceed to do that. And, and Sam's our, uh, you know, go between, so to speak. And so Sam's gonna say to the commission, let them know the commission's ready to go with this interlocal agreement. And, and because we give them the project, you know, I think it'd be courteous for us to you know, include that as an agenda and, and act on it right after that first POCAC meeting, which I believe is coming up. What did I just say next week? So. Um, with all due respect, Commissioner Downing, uh, the POCAC expressed um, reservations about working on the ILA since that's the type of thing that staff usually do. And if 
we move forward on the interlocal agreement that provides a foundation for the Citizens Advisory Committee to do their work. I might uh, interject here. The uh, interlocal agreement is more of a legal document that uh, tends to bind us to agreement to whatever it happens to cover with. And we've done other interlocal agreements on other issues in the past. And I think that the interlocal agreement is something that staff and legal should be working on to make sure it uh, has its correct foundations and, and boundaries and that we're not overstepping or getting outside of the whatever is covered in the legal aspects of things. So I would suggest that we ask staff to proceed with getting one drawn up, have it available maybe, I don't know if it can be done that fast, but have it available for discussion at the next POCAC meeting. But uh, I think that that is really a, a staff legal uh, issue. So I would propose that we just move forward with that, with the anticipation of bringing back even a rough draft to the POCAC to review, so. I agree, Commissioner McGregor. Uh, just as a matter of scheduling, I can tell you that uh, we will not have uh, things available by, by next week and to be able to put out to the um, POCAC. Um, I have been working with um, uh, legal already on this. There's some questions as to, to uh, what the actual form and terms of the, the agreement are since um, we are not a, uh, a land use um, uh, regulatory a uh, agency we're not, and we're not a full, uh, full service government. So. Uh, we're, we're looking into it. Um, it will take us a little bit bit of time to sort it. I, I believe that our, our support for the plan might come in a uh, different format than the ILAs that are being um, being signed by the um, land use authorities of the three municipalities and the um, and the uh, county. So um, we're, we have a little bit different role in here. Uh, we think still can be very supportive of it, uh, incorporated into. Um, you know, uh, uh, continue to be uh, a part of the planning process, but it's just a, a little difference. And it's gonna take us a, a, just a bit to sort that out. We won't have that ready by next week. Thanks for moving forward with that executive director. I trust that staff and legal can work that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. And thank you commissioners for your comments. Uh, um, I'm glad we are on the same page on that. <clears throat> Is there any other, uh, other business? <clears throat> Um, I have one and uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not asking a question, Sam, but you know, it'd be nice to get a, another report on the ferry in the next week or two. That's a real soft pedal request, okay? Um, we did meeting announcements. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you everybody and thank you. Uh, for the great presentations.